topic we're covering tonight is alcohol and the believer. And the very first thing I think about whenever I think of alcohol and believers would be Ephesians 5.18. So turn there with me. And as we're turning there, I would like to ask, I don't know how many of you usually are used to responding in any way in church, but uh, how many of you are willing to let us see uh, one of two things. Either you are from a family of alcoholics. Uh, both my grandfathers died of cirrhosis of the livers. Uh, both of uh, my mother and father's side were, were alcoholics. I mean, uh, my parents met in a bar, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm from a long line of alcoholics. But how many of you either are from an alcoholic family or were saved out of alcoholism? That would be very interesting for me to know how many people have even thought about this like I have. So if that's you, just stand up. I'd like to see either you were saved out of alcoholism or your family has a generational alcoholism. That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, you may be seated. Did you know what? That's about right, proportionately. Did you know one um, out of every 16 people in America is an alcoholic? Did you know that? Depends on who's counting but the National Institute for Health says that a minimum that there are 18 million male alcoholics in America. 18 million. And that's, that's only about 6% uh, of our population. But then you add to that the children, this is adult males, that the children, and then the ladies. And we have a huge proportion of our population. Okay, so look at chapter 5. And this is, this is just where, where I would start if, if you ask me this at the microphone. It says this, do not be drunk with wine. Define drunk. Drunk means under the influence of. Uh, you know, we don't mind our culture says it. They, we have DUIs, right? Driving under what? Influence. Did you know we're supposed to be LUIs, right? Living under this influence of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord says, so never be a DUI or any other UI uh, with alcohol. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. It is amazing that the Holy Spirit defines uh, drinking enough alcohol in the first century to cause drunkenness as dissipation. It just dissipates your life. But here's the positive. But be filled. By the way, that's one of those um, imperatives of the Bible. An imperative is something God expects from us and wants a response. And his expectation is that we be constantly, and, and by the way, it's passive. We can't fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. See what it says then? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I can't fill myself with the Holy Spirit. It's not like, you know, we have a little red compressor. We plug it in the garage. It goes fills up. And I can go around and, you know, air up all the bikes and, you know, the tires of the snowblower. I did that. I'm expecting s snow soon. Uh, but uh, it says you can't fill yourself up, but passively allow the Holy Spirit to, to fill and control us. So there's a contrast. We can choose something else to control us, to influence us, which is alcohol, or we can do what God wants, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So now to answer the question, I, I, I actually have this in my Bible because, remember, I'm a youth pastor at heart. I started out as a youth pastor. For five years, I was a youth pastor. Uh, still speak at many, uh, I mean, they still, as old as I am, I still speak at, at high school camps and junior high camps and college retreats and everything else. And so this is such a common question that actually in the front of my Bible have written down my convictions, and I'll read them to you, my convictions from God's Word about alcohol and me. And, and what I, the reason I'm going to read this to you before I show you how I came to those convictions is that you should do something similar. Did you know that's our biblical responsibility? The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. If you do not know what God says and you're doing it, then you're very likely uh, getting into a realm where you may be sinning against the Lord. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to sin against him. So I spent a long time uh, being from generational alcoholics and uh, being around all my relatives drank. I, I don't remember any activity I ever attended as a young person with my family that they weren't all drinking and carrying the bottles outside and shooting them with BB guns and breaking them. I mean, it was just normal. Everybody drank except me. And I didn't drink because my parents wouldn't let me. 
And that's the only reason I knew until I studied the Bible. And then I came up with this. First, I don't drink because God always condemns drunkenness in any form in his word. And so I personally want to stay away from participating in or encouraging others to participate in what God condemns. That was my first conviction I came to, the drunkenness, because that's the clearest one in the Bible. My second conviction is I don't drink because God commanded that any priest who came before him in the tabernacle or later the temple was not to drink. That was very interesting to me. That's in Leviticus 10, verses 9 and 10. What the Bible says is alcohol kept priests, and I quote, from being able to distinguish between the holy and the unholy, the clean and the unclean. So what God told way back before the joys we have of being new covenant Christians with the Holy Spirit always indwelling us, way back then in the dark times, 20 or 3,500 years ago, God says, you priests that represent me, you can't drink because you wouldn't be able to know the difference between the holy and the unholy, the clean and the unclean. And so the second conviction I came to, and that was, you know, bopping through the Bible as a young person, and I came across Leviticus, it's so boring anyway to find anything good in there, was neat for me. And so I wrote down, and I still have this written in my Bible, I never want to miss what God calls both holy and unholy. And so the second reason I came to personally that I don't drink is because God told the priests not to. And I connected that, of course, with Peter saying, we're all a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Thirdly, I don't drink because God said that those who lead his people are not to drink. Did you know that? Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 isn't just about wonderful wives and mothers and, and women. The opening verses say, it is not for those who are kings who lead my people to drink because they might not lead effectively. So basically, uh, they were, if they were under a wrong influence when they made decisions, it would diminish their ability to make proper decisions. And so I wrote, alcohol diminishes a leader's ability to lead wisely, so I never want to have my ability to lead in whatever realm it is diminished by alcohol, because I've seen how it diminishes. Remember, I've been around drinking people my whole life. Uh, when I was a salesman, I don't think there was ever a sales meeting I went to that people weren't drinking and they just loosened up the further we got into the meeting. Number four, my fourth conviction is I don't drink because God led Paul to say that he would limit his freedom and never eat meat or drink alcohol, that's Romans 14 and verse 12, or I mean verse 21, if it caused any believer to veer off God's path. Paul said, I'm gonna limit my freedom to eat meat that is from those idols temples or to drink wine, which everyone does. My whole life, I'll limit that if it causes a believer to, in their saying, hey, Paul does it, I'll do it too, to veer off the path. You know, the most deadly drug in the world is not heroin, and it's not crack, and it's not meth, and it's not, it's not any of those things. The most dangerous drug in the world is alcohol. Um, you know, I think about how you know, when you think about creation, God created a wonderful straight line, or I guess you could go like this, if you're proper. That is the elemental level, the molecule of alcohol. It's amazing. That's the most singularly destructive drug in the world. Uh, there are 140 million people that we're sure are going to go to hell if they don't repent. That's how many avowed alcoholics are in the world that, that declare it publicly. And God says, no drunkard. Alcoholism is not a disease. It's a choice. It does lead to physical deterioration of the body. I know. I've lived around it all my life. It does lead to physiological problems. But it's just like denying that gonorrhea is a disease. Gonorrhea is a byproduct of a choice. Alcoholism is a byproduct of a choice. It's not a disease. It does lead to physical maladies, but people who are controlled by alcohol, God says, will never see 
the kingdom of God. And so because of that, because Paul said he'd limit his freedom, that's my fourth conviction. My fifth one is, I don't drink because God contrasts alcohol with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5 that I just read to you. And I want to be known as a man that seeks the influence of the Holy Spirit, not alcohol. I watched growing up, for 21 years I watched trying to figure out the benefits that my relatives got from drinking. All it did is made them louder, warmer, looser, but I didn't see that in any of their lives it made them godlier, holier, more disciplined, more seekers of the Lord, having more brain cells that could meditate on God's word. In fact, every time they drank, they were pickling a few more of both their liver cells and their brain cells. Number six, the sixth reason I don't drink is because God said elders have a higher standard than deacons or even other people in the church. I mean, I actually wrote that down because from age nine, I knew, that I've, I knew that God had called me to be an elder because in the Bible, an elder is a pastor, is an overseer. So I knew from age nine, watching all this, that the Bible said that elders are, in the Greek language, to be me par oinos. Oinos is a word for wine. Par means beside. Me means not. So the simplest explanation for me is a, little guy called of the Lord knowing I was going to be an elder someday is elders have a higher calling than deacons in the Bible I'm not talking about that they have a higher pay grade they have a higher calling written down they are me par oinos they are not to be near wine deacons are not to be drinking too much to show that that they're not given to wine and normal people are not to be drunk and so the sixth conviction I have is because God said elders have a higher standard than deacons or others in the church, and since, since they are called to not stand near wine in 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, that I took that, that verse the way Timothy must have. Remember Timothy? In 1 Timothy 5, Paul had to tell Timothy he could take medicinal alcohol. Timothy wanted so badly to be an elder for God he wouldn't touch the stuff, even though it was normal in the Roman world. Because of their horrible uh, treatment of water, most people used wine just as a disinfectant, if for nothing else. Uh, not only to make the water taste good, not only because it made them feel good, but it also helped them stay healthy. And Timothy wouldn't do that. And he got sick. And Paul said, First Timothy 5.23, please, Timothy, use a little wine for your constant ailments. Even though you don't want to disqualify yourself from being an elder, you can use it medicinally at least, Timothy. And that was my sixth reason because of that high calling for elders. But finally, and now remember, these are my convictions. I haven't started writing on the board yet. And this is what all of us should come to. We should be, Romans 14, fully convinced in our own mind. But fully convinced in my own mind doesn't mean that I go around, I'm not an abolitionist. I mean, the Drake party store can sell as much as they want, and as long as they're unsafe people, they're going to be in business. And, and wherever they sell alcohol, there, we are not to be, Christians are not abolitionists. Some Christians were, and some Christians still might want to be, but we are not to go out and to destroy. We're not iconoclastic. I don't go down and smash every idol in every Catholic church in the world. That is not, or every Buddha. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to have personal convictions that we live out, not to impose them, Romans 14 says, on others. Now, I'm going to share within the perimeter that I can write in tonight what the Bible says, but you know what our responsibility is individually? To come to our own conclusion. But here's my final, my seventh conclusion that I've written in my Bible. I don't drink because our whole beer-drinking, bar-hopping, clubbing society that portrays alcohol almost always with things that displease God. You know, it says in Psalm 1 that if you really love the Lord, you don't walk, stand, or sit with people that scorn God. That cuts out most parties, especially ones where they're dripping the vodka over the ice cube and you're cutting channels in it and laying underneath it and drinking it and slowly getting totally acting like an animal. That's mocking God. You say, well, I don't go that far. Yeah, but the Bible says don't stand, walk, or sit with people that do. 
You say, well, how did Jesus witness? Well, Jesus witnessed, but they didn't keep him around very long. They, they wanted to hear the gospel, but the people that were resisting the gospel, they didn't invite Jesus to every one of their parties. This notion that, that we're supposed to go to bars to talk to unsaved people, if the unsaved person, I used to go to bars to talk to unsaved people, I stood outside of them. In Seneca and Clemson, Wallahalla, every Friday night for four years. I stood outside of bars, actually with my back to the bar, trying to stop the men from the mill to come and cash their check in there and spend the whole thing at the bar. That's what they did. And we would walk those men home with their paycheck to their wife and say, um, look at your kids, They're, they look hungry. They're living in these little shacks. Why don't you cash that at the grocery store instead at the bar? And we'd share the gospel and tell them how they could be liberated from that. But finishing this, I don't want to befriend the world's ungodly cultural form of drinking we see today, as James 4 tells, because friendship the world is making God your enemy. I don't want to get conformed to the world. You know, evil company corrupts good manners. The scriptures say that. We should not get comfortable around what the world does to help them in their drowning out the conviction of God in their life. And finally, I don't want to love the tool that the world uses to enslave so many, destroy so many, and lead so many into sin. So those are my printed in my Bible convictions that, that I read when I talk to teenagers. Do you, you know, parents here tonight, did you know that most teenagers and college kids that drink across the board in our country say they drink because their parents do. Hmm. It's interesting. Share that when they've got their car wrapped around a telephone pole and you're hoping they live. They say, I was just being like you, but they didn't have the same restraint the parent had. So, how do you come to a biblical conviction about drinking? Well, go back with me now to Ephes or Galatians chapter 5. That's where I want to go next, and I've got to write this down. Because what, I, what I'd like to talk about is what the Bible says. Let's define what God says about drinking. And first, you heard me say a lot of things, but let me first, Galatians 5, uh, starting in verse 19 through 21. And I'll just read it to you, and I want you to see what, what God says uh, about drinking. Uh, chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and here they come. And remember, I already told you this, that that usually sexual sins are either first or second in every list, and that's no, uh, you know, it, it's here as it usually is. Adultery, number one. Fornication, number two. Uncleanness, that's filthy, you know, perverted minds thinking about all kinds of horrible stuff. Lewdness, I mean, isn't it, just read the newspapers, all the lewd things in our society. God said that's all bad. Look at verse 20. Idolatry, bowing down to any form of anything that you worship other than God. Sorcery, Greek word pharmakeia. What does that sound like in English? It sounds like Walgreens, doesn't it? That's pharmacy. This is drug-induced occultic connection. Did you know they've always done this since ancient times? Drugs have always been used to control people to open up the gateway to the spirit world. The mind is the gateway to the spirit world. And to open it, they would get into a trance, a drug-induced trance. That's what Native Americans, I mean, the, the whole smoking loco weed stuff, it was to open them up to the spirit world. It's not new, it's ancient. And it's always been condemned. drug you know, there, yes, there's no verse in the Bible that says don't smoke marijuana or sniff whatever or take whatever. But you know what is in the Bible? Don't allow any drug to impair your ability to guard your mind from the spirit world and to impair your ability to obey and commune with God. It doesn't matter what form that drug takes. Pharmacaea is right there, or sorcery, or contact with the spirit world because of drugs. Hatred, hatred's in bad company. We, we're not supposed to hate, it's like murder. Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, right, with all that stuff? That's the American dream, to be ambitious for yourself. That's what selfish ambitions are. I have great ambitions for me. I'm going to advance me. It's very interesting. Selfish ambitions is right there. Dissensions, 
People just like to argue because they like to argue. Heresies. And now we get to verse 21. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries and the like, of which I tell you before, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Will not have eternal life. Will not spend eternity with the one who loved them and gave himself to free them from those sins. So drunkenness is always condemned, always. There, there is not ever a positive uh, reference to drunkenness in the Bible, uh, cover to cover. Well, real quickly, I want to show you what I mean about, uh, go back with me to Leviticus, uh, and I've got to write this down. I'm not supposed to just read, I'm supposed to write. Uh, Leviticus 10, and I want to show you how, uh, and, and by the way, it's not only here, it's in 1 Corinthians 5, it's in 1 Corinthians 6. The same list of sins are, are repeated in 1 Corinthians twice. It says the same thing about these shall not inherit. But I want to show you something interesting. Look at Leviticus 10. Uh, this is the first time we see God regulating alcohol consumption among his people. Very fascinating. And by the way, one way to always understand the Old Testament is that if something is abhorrent to God in the Old Testament, do you think it's not abhorrent to God in the New Testament? I mean, consider that. Think about if God says this is an abomination, if this is something that, that I hate, is it something that he would change? You know, is he like us that, you know, when we're expecting, we, we hate certain smells, but when we're not expecting, you find your wife likes the, the thing she hated. It's not like pregnancy or anything else where we flip-flop around and change our desires and tastes and likes and hates. God is immutable. But watch what it says in chapter 10. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, verse 1, took their censer, put fire in it, put incense in it, and they offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So the fire went out from before the Lord and devoured them. Wow, that was a quick response. And when you read that, you go, what, what did they do wrong? What is profane fire? They didn't light? I mean, I just had a cookout with my family on Friday. Profane fire, I didn't light it the right way, and God's going to burn me up if I did that in the tabernacle? No. Watch what happens in verse 8. Then the Lord spake to Aaron, saying, verse 9, Leviticus 10, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Verse 10, that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, clean and unclean. You know what happened? They were drinking when they went on the job. And they, they did not follow the Levitical God's written down regulations for the way he wanted things done in the temple or the tabernacle then. And it was profane because it was just the way they wanted it done instead of the way he wanted it done and because they were his representatives. See, the, so what you have to think about and what, what began my convictions, I don't drink because my parents drank. I don't drink because all my relatives died of that. You know, you can die of a lot of things. You can die of, you know, overexposure to all kinds of stuff. That, that isn't a good conviction basis. What I saw is that those that represented God weren't supposed to represent him in a way that he had not commanded, and alcohol affected them so they didn't. And they began not clearly seeing what was profane, what was holy, what was unholy, what was clean, what was unclean. So that's them. Now turn to chapter 31 of Proverbs. This is the next one that I mentioned, Psalms right in the middle and Proverbs. And what it says is uh, that leaders have a high calling. Proverbs 31. Got to remember to write these down. Proverbs 31. So uh, priests that represented God uh, know alcohol. That's interesting. Now, leaders of God's people. It says this, and let me get there with you. Proverbs 31, verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him, what, my son, and what, son of my womb, and what, son of my vows. Verse 3, do not give your strength to women. Now listen to this. Nor your ways to that which destroys kings. 
Now we get into alcohol, verse 4. And this is what it says, Proverbs 31, 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink. Now immediately, and I'm not going to spend the time on this tonight because, you know, it causes uh, snickering. You know, when people hear that in the Bible, when, when you see the word wine in the Bible, it really meant three, it could mean three different things. Uh, it could mean um, just what they, what they made uh, for storage, uh, which would be what we would call boiled grape juice. And they actually made it into syrup because they wanted to keep it. And, you know, not everybody wanted to drink anything with alcohol in it all the time, especially their children or whatever, and so they just stored this stuff. They would bring in the grape harvest and they would boil. Then they had what you see here called wine. Then they had something else, intoxicating drink. That's interesting. You mean wine is not intoxicating drink? I mean, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes. Now, the, the principle of parallelism is that both of them are intoxicating, but the truth is that there was a form of wine that the U.S. government would not even consider to be intoxicating because if it's under 3.2% or whatever it's at right now, it's not to be classified as intoxicating. Uh, and so it is very possible to have wine that is 225, 275, all kinds of stuff that they used to mix up from their boiled stuff. But then they had, there's clearly, they were drinking, you know, this notion that, uh, uh, that nobody drank intoxicating beverages in the Old Testament is, doesn't fit with the text because people were drinking. And so there are a group of people that say that that no, God never let people ever drink wine any time. And that just makes immediately people go, you know, it doesn't square with the text. But look at this. It isn't for kings to drink wine, verse 4, nor for princes to drink intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert justice to the afflicted. Here's what you're supposed to drink for. Give strong drink to him who's perishing. And those who are bitter of heart, let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. There is a, a use. There is a, it's almost like, um, you know, I met someone this morning that's in the service and they're on perpetual morphine. They're in so much pain and their cancer is so rampant and so racking their body that they, they only keep from groaning because of the constant subduing of that pain through substances. And, and that is here, and also to encourage. It always says in the Bible that alcohol is very encouraging. Okay, uh, we'll never get through this. No wonder we only get one question at a time. It's that speaker speaks too long. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm skipping over a lot. Uh, you know, wine is mentioned 256 times minimum in the Bible. Wine, strong drink, drinking, and all that. But look at 1 Timothy 3. I want to show you the whole elder uh, that I alluded to earlier. And so 1 Timothy 3... Um, I'll write it over here, 1 Timothy 3, verse 3, and also we're going to look at Titus 1, 7, and also Titus 2, which we covered. But 1 Timothy 3, 3 says this. This is a faithful saying. I'll start with verse 1. If a man desires a position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop, then, must be blameless. Now, what are bishops? I mean, are we... Do we have any of those around here? This is, there are three words that are, and I'm not covering this right now, but three words in the Bible that are used interchangeably for the leaders of the church. Elders, presbyteros, overseers, episkopos. You've heard of episcopal church. That's the church that has overseers. And pastors, which is shepherd or poimen. So what a pastor does, pastoring in the Bible, is shepherding. Pastors shepherd. And overseers oversee. And elders are leaders, but that is all three, a facet of one person that's described, and those are church leaders. And so this is talking about this, this elder, this, this uh, wise person must be, verse 2, an elder must be then blameless, the husband of one wife, and here it is, temperate. Now, now this is very interesting. This, this word, 
there are actually two words in here that touch on alcohol. Um, this one is a broader word. Temperate uh, is a word that speaks about not being influenced. But there's a lot of things that can influence us. It's the word uh, uh, in English, nef alias. Uh, nepho is the, the verb, nepho. Basically, it means unclouded, not impaired. Um, there are a lot of things that can impair you. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Delphian Oracle in the ancient world, there used to be a volcanic fissure in the ground, and they had this chair over it, and these poisonous gases would come up out of there, and they would sit in the chair and breathe that in and go into a trance. That would be an example of not, of, of not practicing this, of allowing something to cloud your mind. But keep reading. So, so, and by the way, in classical Greek, this word nepho or nephilias, in classical Greek, not in the New Testament. Classical is outside the New Testament. But outside the New Testament, that word meant abstinence from alcohol. That's how it was used in classical literature. But it isn't used that way in the New Testament, so you don't have to worry. Keep reading, though. It says uh, he is to be temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable. That word hospitable is a good word. It means a lover of strangers. The people that God says are my special leaders in the church love strangers. The church never, when led by biblical elders, never can become a country club. You know what a country club is? It's a group you're comfortable with and you don't want outsiders in, so you just raise the, you know, if you want to keep your country club exclusive, like Southern Hills and Tulsa, you raise the membership fee to 50000 or 200000 or 500000 and you just keep out the people you don't like. You just keep raising the fees, you know, to keep it exclusive. Churches are like that. And people come in, and no one loves strangers in that church, and they feel like a stranger, and no one reaches out to them. You know, I was just over in this section two weeks ago, and I bumped into someone that I could tell they didn't frequent church, and I could tell they probably never here before. They just looked all nervous. And I started talking to them, and as I was talking to them, I was kind of scanning the whole section, looking for someone that was, you know, willing to meet them. And as I was talking to them and asking them a question, one of our... Um, Sunday school teachers from the, the elementary department was just walking in and, and they saw what I was doing. They walked right down and said, he's saying that there are friendly people here and I'm one of them. I would like to meet you. And I thought, that is exactly what this verse means, that we are to be characterized by being hospitable. That doesn't mean inviting people over to show them your Lennox, you know. It means to love strangers. It's not to show off your better home and garden. It's to love strangers. A lot of times we think of hospitality as showing off our cooking skills. It's not that. It's loving strangers. But, but keep reading. I'm not on that tonight. Ha, able to teach. Look at verse 3. And here is the neat one. Here is the qualification that's higher for an elder. Not, literally it says, not given to wine. But what it says in the text is, may par oinas. Oinas, that part of the word, means wine. Par means by. May means not. Now, what do you think that means? Not by wine. You see, there's a carryover of this concept that those that represent God, the priests of the Old Testament, were to not be those that were near what was such a disaster, even in the ancient world, drunkenness is not new. Now, it's easier to get drunk, faster to get drunk. Remember, the highest concentration of alcohol that they could get in the ancient world was 7% to 11 You know, beer is, I don't, I'm, I'm deficient in my knowledge of this, but I don't know, beer is, what, 3 or 4 or 5%. Uh, but wine can be up to 7 to 11 This is all they could do in the ancient world. And so they, it took a long time, especially if it diluted the stuff, to get drunk. But nowadays, nowadays, since the Arabs invented distillation in the Middle Ages, 
we now have distilled spirits. Why can you only get wine to 7 to 11%? Because everybody knows that, that the, the alcohol content will be one half of the sugar content. But once alcohol gets to a percentage of 11%, the alcohol itself kills the fermentation agents because the anaerobic, you know, I, I didn't, I'm not a brewer, but it, there's just a, a scientific law that limits without distilled spirits, you cannot on your own, in your backyard with your, with your wine vat, make anything stronger than 11%. That's just how it is until they figured out how to distill stuff. But whether it was 11 or 7 or 4 or 5, the elders were not supposed to be near the stuff. And you know what? Someone that heard Paul say that, turn the page to chapter 5, verse 23. Someone that actually heard him say that, in fact, the letter was written to them. You know what's always interesting to me? It's not what I think it means. What did someone that was sitting in the audience and heard the message think that they were saying? That's what always helps me. When I read the Gospels, whenever you're reading the Gospels, if you notice that the the Pharisees or the Sadducees or whoever pick up stones to, to throw at Christ. He just said something important. You know, read it. Whatever happens just before that was something, and they caught what he said. Well, look what Timothy says in, in verse 23, or, or what Timothy thought. Paul said to him, you know, there's a lot of good stuff. Verse 22, don't lay hands on anyone hastily. So, you know, you don't raise people up to leadership quickly until you really know them. Uh, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. I mean, this is all practical advice. No longer drink only water. What happened to Timothy? Timothy was a good Jewish cultured person uh, that had known that, that, you know, that you weren't supposed to get drunk, but it's okay to, but why did he stop? Because he had heard Paul teach this, and he did it. And Paul says, you know, it's not good for you to drink only water for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Now keep going to Titus chapter 1. I'll just show you. Look at, at verse, um, Titus chapter 1 and verse 7. Let me get the right page here. It says, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine. That isn't this word. It's this, these two words. And you know what's interesting, when you get to women, it's interesting what it says in verse 3 of chapter 2. The older women, the ones that are supposed to be models, the ones that are supposed to have their life as a template to disciple and nurture and, and to cause such a, a wonderful discipleship revolution in the church, they are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, and not given to much wine. They were supposed to be an example to the younger women to not allow themselves to have this external substance encourage them uh, because life was hard back then. So basically, you can see that the, the elders had this higher calling. But look what it says when you get to deacons. Look at 1 Timothy 3. Just turn back because, you know, I want you to see what I was talking about. 1 Timothy 3, it says... Um, Likewise, the deacons, verse 8, must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine. That is not the same word. What it says is that they are not to be, and it's not me par oinas. It's actually not too much. In other words, they aren't supposed to allow it to affect them at all. Did you know that alcohol affects you, especially if you've never drank very much, it affects you quickly, and, and it can have, and they said, you guys should be very cautious that you deacons, the elders aren't supposed to associate with it, but you are never supposed to look like you are, you are standing too close to the bowl and getting too much, because remember, they used to make wine in bowls, that's why it's called mixed drinks, they aren't talking about a little shot of this and a little shot of that, like at a bar, they were talking about mixing that, that stuff that they, that they made and boiled, and then they would mix it and allow it to ferment, and then they would put spices in, and they'd mix water. It became a kind of like a punch bowl. Well, you know, even if it was 2 point whatever, you know, 2.25 or lower percent, if you drank enough of that punch, it would affect you, and the deacons weren't supposed to drink enough of the punch to get 
connected. Okay, real quickly, I want to turn my last one, and then um, I'll finish this up. Look at Proverbs chapter 20. And i uh, got to write this down. got to remember to write it down. Proverbs, there are three passages in Proverbs. We already covered 31. We won't do that one, but 20 and 23 are, are two more passages before I exhaust all the scriptures that I want to show you tonight and finish this up. But Proverbs chapter 20, let me get there with you. And by the way, if you ever want to uh, uh, do this, it's interesting as you study the Bible to write references. Uh, every time I read through Proverbs, I look for something different. You know, I look for what it says about money or parents or parenting or marriage or whatever. And then I try and lump together all the verses, kind of make my own topical guide instead of buying Lockyer's, you know, all the whatevers of the Bible. And what I wrote by 20 is that, that chapter 23 and chapter 31 have verses about alcohol. So, you know, you just lump them together so you can remember where they are. But look at chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So that's a good, you know, it, it says that's a sign of a lack of wisdom to be led away by that. Now turn to chapter 23 and look at verse 20. And this is probably the most expansive portion of the Bible about alcohol. And it's very interesting. Look at verse 20. Do not mix with wine bibbers. People that love to drink just for drinking. Don't mix with them. Now, remember Jesus was accused. Remember the Pharisees, they knew that verse. And they went, oh, you're around wine bibbers. Jesus says, I'm not standing around drinking with them and acting like them. I am going, and they are, you know, hearing me share the gospel. But what this is, is don't mix. Don't, don't, don't participate with them. Do you know what this is? This is recreational drinking. Did you know Christians are not supposed to recreationally drink with unsaved people? That's mixing with wine bibbers. It's okay to go, Jesus went to all the parties where the wine bibbers were. It doesn't mean you stay a mile away from every believer. You don't mix with them. Why? Because look what it says in the next verse. Do not mix or with gluttonous eaters of meat. Oh boy. We usually don't say that in the same breath and God does. Do you know what God says? There are people that are addicted to food and there are people that are addicted to alcohol. And did you know that gluttony is a sin that needs to be repented of just as much as alcoholism and drunkenness is a sin that needs to be repented of? The Lord puts them in the same verse. It's very interesting. Keep going. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. And then it says, you know, listen to your dad, but now get down to the end of the chapter. Look at verse 29 of chapter 23. This is the danger of drinking. In fact, I looked up, uh, if you want to really see the signs of the times, look at most universities. Most universities have a guide to the students about how much they should drink. They have charts and everything. It tells what will be affected if you do this and this and this, and it tells you, wh you know, how many it will take to dilate your eyes and how many to put you in a stupor and everything else. This is God's guide. Verse 29, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has contentions, who has complaints, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent, it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or one who lies on the top of the mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? That is one of the most graphic portraits of what alcohol does. So, real quickly, because it's 7.05, I will conclude this with Romans 14. Okay, so you can turn there while I get the board ready, okay? Because I want to wrap it up. What I just gave you is an alcoholology. It's what the Bible says about alcohol. The one thing I have to add is this. Make sure you remember that the Bible n never, never talks about what we have today as far as alcohol. Modern distilled alcohol, which is literally 
literally a powerful drug. I'm talking about anything above wine. When you get to distilled spirits, they're not mentioned in the Bible. They are chemicals that absolutely not only are harmful to the body, but, but are so quickly affecting the mind. So anything that, you, that, that we're talking about with alcohol, we're talking about the alcohol that was in biblical times, which was this, this uh, non-intoxicating uh, grape juice stuff they had. Then they had this mixed wine, they called it, which is mixed with water and mixed with spices. And then they had strong drink, which was drinking this 7 to 11 percent alcohol stuff, drinking it straight. And by the way, both all the Jewish writers and most commentators would say that strong drink, uh, the Bible said that that it was uncommon for Jewish Old Testament believers or New Testament believers to drink straight alcohol. Most of them drank mixed and, you know, kind of all the time, like iced tea was this non-intoxicating grape juice to make the water taste good. The mixed wine was for the, the benefits it gave, like Timothy needed, but strong drink. The Jewish writers said that only barbarians, a good Jew, wouldn't drink that. Only a barbarian would drink straight alcohol. Certainly, none of our refined spirits that, that we have nowadays uh, would ever be um, on the, it's not on the radar for the scriptures. But look at chapter 14 of uh, Romans, and this is what I want to end with. This is about everything that's not clear in the Bible. What's clear in the Bible is no drunkenness. What's clear in the Bible is you are not to give alcohol to your neighbor to intoxicate them, to get them to do things they shouldn't do, as it says in, in the book of Habakkuk. It's very clear in the Bible that, that those who deal in the presence of the Lord, like priests and like elders, are not supposed to have any clouding of their minds, and leaders aren't either. I mean, those things are clear. But what about stuff that's not clear? We call it the gray area. What about people that, I mean, they just, you know, it, it just calms them. It's good for their health. You know, they say medicinally, it's good to have this little amount of, of alcohol. What about them? Well, this is how Paul said. He says in chapter 14, we're under the law of liberty. Receive the one who is weak in his faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. Uh, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to not argue with brothers and sisters in Christ we differ with. And we're not supposed to make fun of them either. Did you know it's very easy to mock people? Very easy. Both ways. People that are more conservative and less conservative than you. It's easy to mock them. He says, don't, don't do that. Don't dis dispute over that. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Verse 3, let him who eats despise, uh, let not him who eats despise him who does eat, let not him who does not eat uh, uh, judge him who eats, for God has received him. And here's the lesson, verse 4. We're all going to stand for God and answer. So in any area that's gray, questionable, not defined by Scripture, we're not supposed to argue over it. And we're not supposed to impose our convictions on others. Um, that, that is so harmful to the church. Why? Because who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Then he goes in, and you can read all this on your own, uh, people that observe one day uh, above another, and that's still present. I mean, especially in Western Michigan. I mean, we really have that stuff. People that observe days. Uh, people that, that, that totally are offended if someone does anything on Sunday. There's, there are people that won't drive more than a gas tank on Sunday because they don't want to buy gas. You know what? That's their conviction. And, and they can have that conviction. But you know what it says here? If they esteem one day above another, let them be fully convinced in their own mind, but they may not impose that on anyone else. And they may not stand and say, are you going to go out to eat today? Are you going to buy gas today? You're sinning if you do. No, it doesn't say that in the Bible. You're not the policeman of the gas buyers and the Sabbath day people. He who observes a day does it to the Lord. So that's, that's how people that fight over stuff, they're not doing it to the Lord. They're doing it to police everybody else. We each are supposed to serve the Lord, is what verse 6 says. Why, verse 10, because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's why I developed my own personal convictions about alcohol, because I know I'm going to have to stand in front of the Lord. He's going to say, hey, what did you do with your life? People were watching you. Um, 
did you model what I wanted you to model or not? It wasn't whether it was convenient for me or whether it was exciting for me or whether it was enjoyable for me or what tasted good to me or what I felt was good. It's what impact it has on others because we're supposed to be encouraging others. In fact, I wanted to read you one other thing before I finish this. This one is in my Bible because I was on staff at Grace. And when I was on staff at Grace, John MacArthur preached through how to make decision-making easy. You've got to get it. It's online. I clipped it off and put it in my Bible many years ago. It's still there. It's called The Ease of Decision-Making. This is what he says. Questionable things in deciding whether or not to participate. Follow this checklist. Number one, is it expedient? Is it something that profits me for eternity or just for a moment? 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Number two, is it edifying? Will this strengthen or weaken spiritual life of, of my walk with the Lord? 1 Corinthians 10, 23. Number three, does it exalt the Lord? Does going to a beach party, drinking beer with hardly wearing any clothes people exalt Christ? No, it doesn't. So, For that reason, I couldn't do it. Evangelism, will this activity increase my evangelistic ability or decrease it? Colossians 4, 5. Example, will others seek to follow my example and be helped or hindered by this activity? 1 Timothy 4, 12. Excess, is this activity a weight? Remember, lay aside every weight that, that so easily trips us up so we can run the race? Excess, does it need to be laid aside? And finally, Emulation, the last E, notice these are E's. That's why I called it the E's of making decisions. Emulation, is this activity something Jesus would do or not? And that, you know, that's the old, what would Jesus do? But back to to, uh, Romans 14 real quickly, because Romans 14 tells us how we're supposed to deal with this. Look, Look what it says, verse 14. The law of love, see the law of liberty is that anything that's not clearly defined in the scripture, I have liberty. Stuff that's clearly defined, I don't have liberty in. And there's a lot that's clearly defined that that biblically illiterate Christians aren't even aware of, and they need to be taught. But if it's not clearly defined, if it's historically a gray area, the law of liberty applies. But there's a second law that most believers haven't thought about. Look at this. It's the law of love. Verse 14, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord that there's nothing unclean of itself. C2H5OH is not unclean of itself. Alcohol. It's not unclean of itself. It's the misuse of it. So nothing's unclean of itself, but let him who considers anything be unclean. To him it is unclean. Look at verse 15. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Don't destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be evil spoken of. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter whether I can have a, you know, 19, 23, whatever to go with my, you know, age stake. It's whether or not me doing that affects someone is what Paul said. And then he goes on, let us pursue, verse 19, the things which make for peace, the things which, by which we may edify one another. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It's good to neither eat meat nor drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So that's the middle. Law of liberty, the first 13 verses, 14 to the end of the chapter. Law of love. Then it doesn't end there. A lot of people think it ends in 14. Look at 15. The last thing is in 15, the first, oh, about six or seven verses. We who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. You keep explaining to them that, that it doesn't say that Sunday is the Sabbath day. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. You just keep showing them that. It doesn't say that. We're not Sabbatarians. You know, it doesn't say that in the Bible. But you don't get upset at them. You don't, you know, just say, you just, you just keep telling them that. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ didn't please himself. And then verse 4, whatever is written was written for through the patience and comfort of the Scripture you might have hope. Basically what it's saying is we follow Christ's example. Look how patient Jesus was. If anybody had liberty, Christ did. And he was so patient with those that didn't understand. And so the law of liberty, if it's not clearly said in the Bible that it's wrong, then you have liberty in that realm. 
law of love, if some other brother doesn't have liberty in that realm, you don't flaunt it. You know, my first missions trip when I used to take Bibles into Eastern Europe, I went to stay with some people our church supported from Fremont area uh, and uh, in Michigan. They were missionaries in Germany. And the first thing they did as soon as I walked in the house is the family all laughed and they all had um, those bottle openers and they all went and took their lids off and they said, it's okay to drink in Europe. And they all drank a bottle of beer in front of me. And I thought, isn't that interesting that you're showing off your liberty? That's not what the Bible says we're supposed to do. And that's the attitude that Christ said emulates him. So, conclusion, the Bible says that people drank alcohol, but they drank it in that lower percentage range, not distilled spirits. So there's no biblical basis for drinking distilled alcohol. It's not only bad for you, it's unbiblical because it can impair your mind. If you ever want to be a spiritual leader, don't be known as a drinker because that disqualifies you. If you want to be an example for Christ, don't do something that in the future will be looked, at a, looked upon like your children saying, I drink because my parents do. Because maybe they will be that one that can't stop. But whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all what? Yeah.